Imagine that maybe this audience does not need. So, I mean, when we look at averages for Sub-Saharan Africa, we know that uh, uh, financial inclusion is still rather low. So we, for these, um, the Global Findex in 2014 shows that only about a third of adults have an account at the financial institution, although this has been increasing a lot because in 2011, it was only 24%. And in terms of um, formal internal remittances, we, we see that only 37% of recipients got them through formal channels. So it is limited, uh, this financial inclusion, in, in the, for the average sub-Saharan African country. Of course, South Africa is the exception, but I won't focus on that here today. Um, but what my focus here and what I want to show you in terms of context is that for the rural areas in Mozambique, where we are going to work, this picture is much... Um, is much uh, more serious in the sense that access to financial services is much more limited. So uh, the number that compares, even though this is for 2009, the number that compares with those 34% of adults on average is 1.3%, okay? So only 1.3% of adult rural population have access to formal savings products. Um, in terms of money transfers, this is also used only in less than 20% of internal remittances so and the alternative here will be that people have to wait for the for say the migrant to go back home or to ask someone i mean a friend or, or a family member to go back home or they need to risk say paying a bus driver to bring their remittances back home and this could cost them 20 percent and sometimes it doesn't get there so it is it is um a context in which we thought that mobile money could be an opportunity because financial inclusion is so limited. And let me start by defining what I mean in this presentation by mobile money, because we know that um, yeah, this type of services, I mean, not necessarily mobile, mobile banking and other fintech products have been expanding a lot. So my, the precise definition here will be a, the, the very basic one. It is one in which you can cash in money to a cell phone account. And here, uh, when I talk about the cell phone, this cell phone does not have to be a smartphone. It, we are talking about dumb phones, okay? So very basic phones um, that you can cash in money into if you if you go to a local agent so for this function here the cashing in you you need a local agent then um what you can also do with mobile money is transfers and this will be key in our presentation and it was also key in the biggest success of mobile money in the african continent which is kenya okay so transfers are very important and you can do this in this context that we'll be studying you can do this from um your mobile money account using your cell phone to any person that has a cell phone it does not have to be the same network okay so um just to make it clear then and and so and to underline that this makes it much easier to make transfers okay compared to the status quo before the service was introduced then you can also use mobile money to pay for products or services you can also buy airtime which we'll see will be an important use uh, that our sample will make of mobile money and finally you can also cash out, that is, uh, transform your electronic money in your cell phone back into cash. But for this, again, you need a local agent. So you need a local agent to, eat, to both cash in and cash out the money, okay? But to make transfers, pay for products, buy airtime, you do not need the agent. You can just do it uh, instantaneously in your cell phone. Okay, so this is our product. This is what we'll be talking about. And this was the innovation that was huge, hugely successful um, in in Kenya, in, um, mostly in Kenya. Okay? So, I mean, the data for, I mean, for South Africa and for other countries, I mean, it has been picking up, but it's not really the same thing. So in Kenya, we saw that in the two years after it was introduced from 2007, 2009, we had more than half of the adult population using the service, 10% of GDP going through the system. So it was really a very huge success that has been increasing over time. Okay. But not only in Kenya, but in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, in general okay so this is the context this is uh, here uh, the opportunity and now what we did okay so this is this is a large project okay there are several outcomes so there was one um on adoption that was recently published in the um, proceedings from the american economic association that lucas had um looked at before 
but here the, the larger project which is what i'll be focusing on today was this experiment this randomized control trial in which we want want to um, evaluate, measure the economic impact of introducing mobile money to rural locations. Okay, so this is a, this is an innovation because um, there are several studies, obviously, that have already been done on introduction of mobile money. But it, I mean, say looking at Kenya, so we have the work of Tavnit uh, Suri at MIT and Billy Jack uh, at Georgetown. But their work, I mean, it was not an experiment because the the um, adoption of mobile money in the country was so fast that no one could do an experiment, trying to introduce it for the first time. So here we had this opportunity uh, that was um, when the service was about to be introduced in Mozambique, so this was already in 2010, 2011, we made an agreement with, um, with the state-owned company, Amcel, and we made an agreement that we were going to introduce this service in rural areas for the first time, and we would do it in a randomized way so that we could uh, measure as rigorously as possible the impact of introducing this service. So we did this in areas that had no formal financial service supply at all. Okay, so the company, what the company wanted to do was making a profit. So they 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 did the introduction of the service in urban areas, in Maputo, and then in other larger urban. Areas. So what we do here is then this first experimental evaluation of the effects of introducing this service in rural areas. Now, what are we going to be looking at in terms of outcomes of interest? So first of all. Obviously, adoption. Okay, nothing will happen if people don't use the service. So, adoption is our first outcome of interest. But then we want to know what people do with mobile money. So, we are particularly interested um, about remittances and savings, which makes sense in the context, the context of very limited financial inclusion that I just described to you. And then we turned to um, first order economic variables that could affect welfare. So, we want to learn about what happens to consumption of vulnerability, especially food security. These rural areas of Mozambique are areas in which uh, episodes of hunger happen. Okay, so this is something that is of key interest here, and I'll show you some results on that. And then also we want to understand what happens to investment. Okay, which, I mean, for those that are more familiar with um, the literature on migration and remittances, we all think, but we never proved it, that um, if you receive more remittances from your migrants, for example, I mean, you could just think that if you are decreasing the transaction cost of sending remittances, you would tend to see more investment. Okay? This is, was our prior when we started, but that's what the experiments do. I'll show you that that was not really the case. And so, and what we'll see is that the main underlying mechanism for all the economic effects that we are going to find has to do with migration. Okay, so what happened here was that we saw migration out of rural areas. And I'll start now by giving you a preview of results so that you can see this all more clear. And then I'll get into details and leave some space for questions at the end. Okay, so in terms of adoption, okay, the striking figure here that was by no means guaranteed before we started was that we really achieved high levels of adoption. Okay, so 76% of individuals in our sample did at least one transaction in the first year, according to admin data. So we are using the admin record from the cell phone company, from the mobile money company. These are actual transactions made, excluding the trial transactions we'll make. And um, in the three years after the introduction, 85% of individuals uh, conducted at least one transaction with mobile money. Okay, so this is, well, just a bottom line. And then um, in terms of migrant remittances and savings, so this financial behavior, what we see is that there was a strong effect on migrant remittances received. So transfers, um, especially in presence of negative shocks. And here I'll tell you about one very large shock that happened six months after we introduced the service. This was really by, by chance. Uh, but what happened is that in January 2013, there were large floods um, in these southern areas of, of Mozambique where we worked. And they affected evenly both our treatment and control areas. So we, we are able to look at villages that were flooded and had mobile money and villages that were um, flooded but did not have mobile money. Okay, We also have some that were not flooded that we use as controls, but this will allow us to see that mobile money was particularly helpful for those villages that were flooded. And so we'll see that migrant remittances 
had uh, received increase, particularly in these instances. And then we also have some measures self-reported by individuals or by families of idiosyncratic shocks, such as um, health problems or deaths in the family. And we see that when these uh, household level shocks happen, we also tend to see more migrant remittances being received. Okay, so this is a very strong uh, effect that we observe. In terms of savings, we don't really see a thing. Okay, so we, the overall savings volume methods, they are pretty much unchanged by the introduction of mobile money. We see that people tend to keep some money in their mobile money account, but this is, I mean, it's a small magnitude and it doesn't really change what people are doing in terms of savings behavior. Now, how does this translate in terms of economic outcomes? Well, first of all, uh, we do see consumption spooling. Okay, so this is consistent with what we see for remittances. We see that uh, particularly when people are hit by negative shocks, either at the village level, so aggregate shocks, or idiosyncratic at the family level, we, we see that people can um, actually increase their consumption um, as a, whenever they have mobile money available. So I'll show you the I mean, regressions and tables we detail, but this is the, um, um, the bottom line, okay? So consumption smoothing is achieved uh, by mobile money uh, whenever there are negative shocks. And then we look specifically at self-reported data on uh, vulnerability, especially to episodes of hunger, and we see that whenever people have mobile money available in their village, they are less prone uh, um, to suffer from episodes of hunger. So this is this uh, very important result that was somehow in the literature already. So that study that I mentioned uh, uh, for Kenya, even though it was not experimental, the, I mean, it also documented very well this idea of consumption smoothing. Um, mobile money is used a lot for transfers, particularly in terms of hardship. Okay, so we confirmed this experimentally, but the result was already in the literature. Now, what was not in the literature, what was most innovative is this, um, result on investment, which we thought was going to be positive, but actually is not. So what we observe for agricultural and business investment, which are the types of investment that make sense in these rural villages that we worked in, was that we don't really see any significant impact on business investment, but we do see negative impacts on agricultural activity. And everyone has a plot of land, but more plots of land are not being farmed after after mobile money is introduced, okay? And investment in, say, fertilizer or seeds, it's also lower. So this was our puzzling new result. I mean, and we had to really think a bit about it because it was not expected, but we came out with uh, this simple theoretical framework. And here I'm just summarizing the arguments that are corroborated by, by our data. And so the way we model here the decision to, to migrate is, uh, basically as a trade-off, well, as typical for economists, right? So where if people sa stay in their home village, they can benefit from informal insurance. I mean, think about um, potential migrants that have their parents in the village. I mean, if before mobile money is introduced, if they live to the urban areas, they have no way of providing, of supporting their elderly parents, for example, if they, if they live, okay? Because there are no ways to remove meet quickly um, in case of need, okay? But of course, this trades off with income gains in urban areas where there are a lot more opportunities for jobs and higher productivity um, uh, occupations, okay? So I should say that most, um, most people in these rural villages, they are still doing subsistence agriculture. So this is the kind of setting in which we are breaking. So this is the trade-off. So migration decisions before mobile money is introduced are made a trade-off between the benefit of staying behind and benefiting from informal uh, insurance or having higher income gains in urban areas. Now, what happens when we introduce mobile money? So when we introduce mobile money, we are able to reduce the transaction costs at these long distance transfers, meaning you can go to the city and you'll be able to provide your parents back home with some transfer, quick, cheap transfer, and safe um, in case of need. So this definitely improves the long distance insurance and changes the trade-off that people were facing. So as a result, we see migration increasing. So what, what we see here in our results 
can be rationalized as some kind of spatial occupational change. Okay, so um, I mean, it, other literature has shown how financial development can um, make people change occupations. So this, this idea of occupational change. What we introduce here in the literature is that is this idea of, of space, of geography, meaning that what you do is you move from your low productivity agricultural activity back home in these rural villages. Uh, you replace it with higher productivity occupations in urban areas, okay? And so this is the main mechanism that underlies the results we find. And that's uh, the preview. I know it's, it's a long one, but I think it will help us now moving forwards, okay? So I have here um, a long outline. I'll try to focus on the main points and leaving some time at the end in case you have um, more questions or detailed questions. So, well, in terms of background for the market, I should say that Mozambique is not very special. It's, it's um, I mean, as in many other sub-Saharan African countries, you have more connections than actual uh, Mozambican individuals um, age 15 plus, okay? So people tend to have several different uh, SIM cards for different networks. The market is competitive. When we started our work, we had state-owned MCEL with the biggest share of the market and Vodacom was also present, but only in urban areas. So when we went to rural areas, it was only Amsterdam. They basically had the monopoly and they were launching the mobile money service. And then Movitel um, entered the market at about the time our study was ongoing, but they were only providing um, cell phone services, not mobile money. Okay, so when we did our work, uh, mobile money had just been allowed to start over, to, to um, had just been uh, allowed legally, uh, and MCEL was the first company to provide this service, so the brand is MCash. Okay, this started being offered in December 2010, mostly in urban areas of Maputo, um, and Vodacom only came like four, four years later, which, I mean, in, in urban areas, m -Pesa has now taken over, but at the time, this was really the single product being offered, and that was our partner, so our partner, um, for this project was the state-owned Amcel company, which offered the MCash uh, product. Okay, so now in terms of exactly what we did. So we went to the field and maybe I'll show you a map, uh, which I think is, uh, it's, it's nicer to, to see exactly what we did and where we did it. So what we did was, we were working here in the southern provinces of, of Mozambique, so which are Gaza, Inyamban, and Maputo, the city. So, Maputo, sorry, Maputo, uh, Maputo province, not the city. Um, and so, these areas here are um, a corridor, an internal migration corridor to the capital, Maputo city. And here we, we see, I mean, and this was important in our design because we knew that in Kenya, that was the driver of the success of mobile money was really transfers by migrants. So we, we placed our project exactly in these areas uh, because they were important migration corridors. I mean, in case you are looking and seeing, ah, uh, this is very specific, okay? Because it's near the coast and it's this area here in Gaza that is one of the uh, better off areas in terms of agriculture. So these are not the most poor, the most isolated or the poorest areas, okay? So in, when you think about external validity, where could these result, results apply? you should think that, well, it's really, we are somewhere in the middle. These are rural areas, they are poor, they, they don't have um, financial services being offered in these villages, but they are not the most isolated excluded. So I would say that actually these areas are quite representative for the situation of rural areas in many other areas of, um, of at least East Africa, okay? So now in terms of the design of the experiment, what we we did this, we worked with 100, 102 villages, to be precise, where we had uh, these treatment areas. The red balloons are the areas where we place the, the mobile money service, and the yellow balloons are the control areas where there were no, uh, where mobile money was not available. And so we followed these villages over time for uh, three years. Okay, so let me give you some details here. Um, yeah, we followed a panel of uh, about uh, 2,000 um, families, okay? So in terms of exactly what did we do in these red balloons, in these treatment areas, what we did was, first of all, agent recruitment and training. Again, no financial services. 
were being offered in these villages. And so the first thing that we did was really to um, place agents in these shops. These shops, I mean, we chose one shop per village and this is what they look like, okay? So these are um, usually the best of, uh, I mean, the better off uh, shop in the village that has the full shelves, that has more liquidity so that the, the service can, um, can work. Okay, so the first step was then to recruit these agents. And after they were recruited, there were community theaters and meetings uh, that looked like this. Okay, so always, I mean, yeah, music and theaters with Q&A uh, were like the media that we chose to try and convey the message. So you see here the people from the, the mobile money company um, explaining exactly how the service works. And then after the second level, we did individual treatments. So we worked with each person in our sample. Sorry, I'll just close my window for a bit. Sorry for the interruption. This is better. I'm, I'm so sorry for this. This is yeah, webinars <laughs> work a bit like this. Okay, so just to say that so with then we worked with each individual in the treatment in those red uh, villages. We we did the registration for them, first of all, and then we did some trial transactions, okay? This is important because people were able to try the service, to experiment, and this obviously, the, the, the goal is always to build trust. So we gave them about $3 in, um, um, uh, I mean, they went to the local shop so that they get to know what's the local shop, they did the cash in, and they checked their balance, okay? They also did an actual purchase, typically a pack of, cookie, uh, of cookies, and, and they, this, they were described the other transactions. So they were given this leaflet that explained how to do things, which is I mean, register for their account, check their balance, uh, check in, um, make payments, uh, make transfers, and the pricing, okay? So all of this was given to people and they kept this leaflet with them, okay? So we opened the account, we did trial transactions, and we gave them this leaflet with all the information they needed to do it again. This is the, the treatment in itself. Okay, so first step was then choose the villages, then do the intervention, and now we will want to measure what happened. To do this measurement, we use different sources of data. First of all, we have the admin records from our partner company that tell us all details about each type of transaction and the value of each transaction. So we recorded a total of um, almost 16,000 transactions between July 2012 and June 2015. And obviously tr trial transactions were excluded from the analysis. Okay, so this is the admin data that I will refer to when I talk about adoption and the impact on um, mobile transfers, for example. Then, uh, because as I told you, there was this large flood six months after we introduced the service, we also to use um, weather shocks data. So we use this standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index, which is arguably the best measure uh, or the best way of measuring um, droughts and floods because it takes into account not only I mean, the rainfall, but also it adjusts for other weather conditions such as temperature and um, the capacity of soil to absorb water, etc. And so this is then the measure that we are going to use whenever we look at the Flood, okay, so so as to know which villages were uh, were suffered the large flood or not. Then uh, we will use survey data. So survey data, we we surveyed our how the households in our panel um, three times. So in 2012 before the intervention, then uh, 2013 and 2014 after the intervention. Okay, and this survey data includes data on consumption, the self-reported household level shocks, vulnerability, namely to uh, episodes of hunger, remittances, savings, and investments. Sir, so maybe it's a good time to ask any questions? Yes, please. If there's anybody who would like to ask questions now, or you can ask questions also at the end. Are there any questions? Yeah, I'm talking, I'm not even looking at the chat box sometimes. Um, Sorry, I've got one. You don't have it, you don't have it done, okay. Yes, please. Sorry, I've got one. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, um, so uh, there was one, so this, you talked about how the total number of, of remittances increased, um, and this is you know, speaking to your results. I just wanted to understand whether 
this was in total value or, or the total amount of unique, uh, like the unique frequency of, of, of remittances? I'll show you. So for, for the actual outcomes, if you wait a little, that's exactly what I'm going to show next. So maybe I'll show them and maybe please stop me if you have questions when I show this information. I think it's easier. Otherwise, we'll start from the back and go to the beginning and it will be more confusing. If that's okay. Cool. Yeah? Sounds good. Okay. Any other questions that you may have here, maybe on the design and exactly what we did for this uh, intervention? Maybe I have questions. How, how did you come to, because you, you have information about transactions. So yes. how did you uh, manage to convince uh, the firm to uh, collaborate? Well, it took us a while, I must say. So yeah, we, we had to do lots of confidentiality agreements with lawyers. And I mean, it took us a while to work on this, to be, I mean, it was like more than a year when we were setting up these, these, I think the interest here was really that, I mean, so the company was starting, they had lots of people really trying to make it work and innovate. And at the time they had like this huge office where we actually have an office. I was, so I was in Maputo like one week a month and I have an office inside the firm because they really wanted us and our team of researchers, of local researchers to work with the company to understand exactly how this was going to work. But to have access to the data, it took us a long, long while. And I think in the end, I think the key words to establish this partnership and then also to make it work in the, in the field is always trust. Okay. So you, we, we essentially, we, we worked together for a long time. We built trust. And I think that's the key um, to explain this. Um, yeah. <laughs> the access to this. Data. It took us a long, long time, lots of effort, lots of time spent together thinking about how to do this. All right. I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So then I'll focus now on, sorry. Okay. Oh, and we also have, so I'm not going to talk about this here, but we also have some behavioral measures. So we played some games with people trying to understand uh, their willingness to save and remit whenever, I mean, when we introduced this new service of mobile money. But for the, in the interest of time, I won't present it here. This is available in the paper, which is available in my website if you want to look at it. And I'm, I'm very happy to take questions uh, if you wish. Okay, so now in terms of econometrics, now to study the effects of these interventions, so the, it, it, the econometrics are very simple. It's just a simple uncover specification where we take into account um, the baseline level of the outcome that we are interested in studying. Our variable of interest will be this beta here, which is the, um, um, the ITT effect. Okay, so the first question, as I told you, is First of all, was mobile money used? We want to understand adoption before we move on to understand uh, what happened to other economic outcomes. And so what we see here is that in the first year, as I mentioned, so this is the same bottom line that I, ref that I described to you before, we see that 76% of individuals in the treatment areas performed at least one transaction in the first year. Okay? And, this, and then it went up to 85% uh, over three years. Okay, so here, um, as we describe in more detail in that um, uh, American Economic Association proceedings papers, so what we see is that we have early adopters, but then there are late adopters that come into play um, later on, and there are also some that try it in the first year and then and then uh, stop uh, using it. But I think one of the, uh, I mean, one of the questions that I tend to get a lot is, but how can you keep following these people over three years because supposedly if this is such a huge success you should observe i mean you should also have adoption in control locations uh but actually it was not the case okay and this can be explained because the the company the mobile money company it was investing in urban areas because that's what where they expected to make money but not really in rural locations so rural locations where we did not introduce the service did not really have services available Okay, and so this kept for these three years. So that's why we have this very low number of only up to 1.8% um, users of mobile money in the control locations. And control locations here are those villages where we did not place the mobile money agents over these three years. Okay, now in terms of exactly what people did with mobile money, we should say that, well, the preferred thing was purchasing airtime. Okay, people really thought it was very handy to buy credits in, with their cell phones, with mobile money. 
And that was like in the first year, everyone was doing this, and not everyone, 60%. Um, uh, but, and then what people were also doing a lot were transfers, okay? And this is what we expected to observe. So 43% were receiving transfers, 28% were sending them, okay? Now, over time, usage changed, okay? So we had, um, so three years after the intervention, we had 53% uh, of users. So lots of people tried it at first and then stopped using it. And, uh, Airtime purchases were down to 30% and uh, transfers um, received were still sizable, 22, but I mean, not the size was before. Uh, same transfers also dropped. And what we were seeing was an increase, and this was an increasing trend in remote payments. So long distance um, transactions were increasing, but the first year was kind of special. Okay, And the, our problem here is we cannot really distinguish between the effect of that flood that I'll show you had prompted a huge surge in uh, transfers okay, uh, compared to what happened uh, afterwards. But I'll show you some more data in which this will hopefully be clear. And I'll talk about remittances now. Um, okay, so I'll skip the tables. I'll, I'm happy to go back to them if you wish, but I think it's better to give you a general idea of results. And then I'll go back to the details if you wish. So, okay, so grant that people were adopting the service. Our question now is, what were the economic consequences of this introdu introduction of mobile money and its usage? And that we wanted to know was, well, consumption smoothing and vulnerability. So, as I said, so for Kenya, we know that there is evidence that introduction of mobile money helped um, households smooth their consumption. Did the same happen here was our question. And what we find is uh, a very strong strong, a positive answer to this question, okay? So here, let me describe you this table. Um, so what we have here is um, an interaction between the treatment, which is the availability of mobile money, and the negative shock. And I'm going to consider two types of shocks. And so these two columns are different types of shocks. First column is this village flood index. So this has to do with, um, this is the, a negative shock at the aggregate level. Aggregate here means at the house, at the village level. So the whole village was flooded. Um, what kind of an impact did this have on consumption? So what we see here is that, well, the impact actually was not uh, significant. It was negative, but not, not precisely estimated, especially after accounting for multiple hypothesis testing. And, uh, but also the, the treatment effect that is, if you are in a village that was not flooded, but had mobile money, you also don't see a big change. So this, this, this means that that the simple fact that mobile money is available is not increasing your consumption, okay? What is really key here is this interaction effect. It's in the villages that were flooded and had mobile money available that we see an increase in consumption, okay? And so this is our evidence for consumption smoothing in this context. Now, when we look at the second column, here what we have is, uh, is again, it's an index that, that combines different types of household level shocks. This could be that someone was got ill, someone died in the family, or someone lost a job. Um, and so what we see here is that when people, I mean, when families have this shock, their consumption decreases for sure. Okay, so this is this, this, uh, this um, coefficient here at the bottom. Then just having mobile money, I mean, the same thing as before, is not significant. It's not changing your consumption per se. Where you really see the consumption smoothing effect is here, this coefficient that is strongly positive and it's, um, it's still positive when you take out this negative effect of the, the, the shock that the family uh, has, okay? So the idiosyncratic shock. Um, one question that people tend to ask me is whether we can compare these numbers. And I should say that because this is a household shock index and its incidence, it's only uh, close to 20%, you should divide these, these these coefficients here by five to be able to compare. And so the effect of consumption smoothing when you have an aggregate shock is actually larger than with the idiosyncratic household level shock. Okay, so this is all as we would expect. I don't know if this is clear or if anyone has questions, but this is like one bottom line uh, result, which is this strong consumption smoothing in face of negative shocks. 
I just have a question about the measurement of uh, the shock. So people were asked questions whether there was uh, someone died in the family or had sickness in the survey, right? Exactly. So it yes. was during this is self-reported. So uh, sorry to interrupt, Lucas. Finished. It was in the period of one year, or because you said that you, you, you did the survey every year, or, right? That's that's a very good question, which is unfortunately, and this is told in the paper. I did not say it here. Unfortunately, we only measured this in the second period, so we did not have this question initially. Um, and then, I mean, we realized also because yeah, there was the other paper, and we realized well, this is really important because initially, when we were designing the experiment, we just thought that we were just looking at the average effects on all villages, okay? So we were just thinking about this, but then we added this question, but it's only for the second um, year after the introduction of the study. So this is somewhere here in the notes behind, but that, that's an important one. Where is the, excuse me, the village flood? It happened in the first year. So these actually, they are not strictly comparable also because they refer to different points in time. Okay, so thank you for, for asking that. And, and, that's and in terms of uh, uh, village flood, it's uh, the whole village, so it's not clear whether it's affecting this household. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, like there was some. Yes. So here, so where is in these, so in column two, these are questions from the survey where we asked if people had had those uh, household level incidents. In the first column, this is admin data. This is that um, uh, SPI uh, data on weather shocks. And so this is for the whole village. We do not measure precisely the incidents at the household level, but we know that the whole village was, was flooded and these were major floods really. So a lot of houses were destroyed, they need to be rebuilt. And that's actually how you explain that this effect is actually positive. People were consumed or, I mean, this is actually a measure of expenditure. So expenditure was actually larger for people that suffered the shock than for those who didn't because they had so i mean so much to spend on just to rebuild their their um village okay but that's that's an that those are important clarifications thank you for asking thank you much thank you okay so yeah so i was forgetting that we still had this we have some questions on vulnerability well-being i mean people always tell you they are happier so we just confirmed that but i think more interesting is when you break down the vulnerability index into access to food, access to clean water, um, access to medicines and to school supplies. So here, one thing that we are doing is we are controlling for multiple hypotheses. So that's these square brackets in the end. So the strongest results are really in this access to food. This refers to, uh, we ask people about whether they were, they, they were suffering, um, I mean, the, or the frequency of episodes of hunger they were suffering. And we've, we saw that in villages that had mobile money available, people did report suffering less episodes of hunger. And I think that's, that's a stronger result here. And so this represents 6 to 11 percent uh, reduction in the incidence of these episodes of hunger. So, I mean, it's not only about consumption smoothing, but it's also about reduced uh, vulnerability or increased food security, as you wish. Okay. And then the question is obviously, how was this possible? And so uh, here, what we do is, I'll show you admin data so the floods happened in January 2013 and this graph shows you the total value of uh, mobile money transfers received okay and so this is in magic cash um, which is the Mozambican currency so what we see here is that at the time right after the flood we saw mobile money transfers of a high volume that was never repeated okay and so this is where uh, I was telling you that yes the effects are very large in the beginning um, and they coincide here a lot with the floods but if we look over time they never go back to this kind of magnitude again okay but still we see them here and 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 so this is consistent with what I was telling you that the consumption smoothing and I'll show you the, the value the, the numbers for remittances now and um, these numbers here are uh, very large at the time of the floods and then uh, they are not so large when presumably the other shocks, the household level shocks are increasing, I mean, more here um, between th 2013 and 14. Okay, so we have these, I mean, the same information in regression format. Um, and so what we see here is that transfers increased for all the villages that had mobile money available, but they increased uh, uh, more when there were shocks. Okay, so here we see 
whether there were remittances on or not. This is the binary variable. And this is the value of these remittances. Okay? And so they increased both when there were village flood, um, village floods and when there were household level shocks. Then we also have data on, from the survey. And I think this was the question uh, that you were asking me before, Marcus. Uh, so, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your name right, but um, so your question here, well, I think was about this, this style. So what we see here is we have very detailed data on remittances. We break down the total remittances between regular cash remittances, those that are sent, say, every month by your family member, the occasional cash remittances that could be uh, sent if someone gets married, if someone dies, if there is an emergency, and also in-kind remittances. So what we observe here is that when we look at this, uh, at this line of, uh, of the treatment of just having mobile money available in your village, we don't really see a huge effect. Excuse me. <coughs> there is some effect here. Um, on regular remittances, but it's, it's, I mean, it's not significant when, when you control for uh, multiple hypothesis testing. So what we see is that there is the increase in remittances we observe when there is a negative shock is mostly driven by occasional. So it is, it is I mean, very much consistent. And so this is what happens when there is the flood shock. This, this other table uh, tells us what happens when there is the household level shock, and this is for the following year, okay? In the following year, we already see some more um, effects of mobile money per se, okay? On regular cash remittances. So over time, this did, did not happen immediately, but over time, you see more regular cash remittances being sent, okay? And the response also to shocks. Okay? I'm not sure if this is answering the questions uh, you were asking before. I think this is a good time to have questions if you wish. It answers my question. Thank you. It does. Uh, thank you. That's my, my pleasure. Okay. So, so remittances are a potential explanation for consumption smoothing. Okay. So it's a financial mechanism that explains a bit this consumption smoothing, but it could also have to do with savings. At least that's what we had as an hypothesis before the experiment. But what we see here is that nothing really happens. So as you can see, I mean, yeah, both in terms of savings. So this is the, the binary variable, so probability of saving. This is value of savings, but nothing really is happening here. Okay, so there are some positive coefficients, but they are not significant. When we break down into different savings components, we also don't see results. The only thing that really happened here significantly was people started saving a bit using mobile money. Okay, but these magnitudes are... Uh, rather low, so I mean we don't make a big thing of, of this. So what happens is people keep a little money in their mobile money account, but this is not really groundbreaking transformation. It does not really change people's savings behavior. So this is not a plausible mechanism for any sort of effect. One thing that is interesting here is that in these two last lines, we compare the numbers we have from the survey with the numbers we have from the admin data, from the actual uh, from the company data. And so what we see here is that actually these magnitudes are very similar. So this is somehow reassuring because you could think that all of these zero effects on savings are due to noisy data, for example. But what we see here is that when we compare the admin data with the survey data, at least for the savings with MCash, they are very, very similar, which is somehow reassuring um, that, well, we really did not have an impact on savings. Okay, so now, so this part on savings on remittances, this was somehow already looked at in the literature, even though non-experimentally. Now, what, where we were uh, trying to, to have our most original findings was on investment. So our hypothesis would be, based on the existing literature, that if you get more remittances, you should invest more in your village. But that's exactly what we did not find. So here we have the numbers for agricultural activity investment. So again, oh, this is my timer so it means that yeah, I'm running out of time <laughs> I'll try to yeah, finish but with time so that you understand what I'm trying to convey sure please take your time no problem. yeah thank you so okay so as I mentioned before in these rural areas pretty much all families have a plot of land they're typically small like one hectare uh, plots but everyone has a, a piece of land so one very important indicator here is 
where the people are farming their land or not. And so what, that's what we mean here with active farm. And so what we find is that uh, people started farming their land less after mobile money was introduced. Okay, this is not a huge effect. So this is, this is uh, five, five or six percentage points, but it is quite significant. Then we have uh, an index of agricultural investment. Uh, and here we also see some negative effects that get stronger with time. So column one is 2013, column two is uh, 2014, and the effects are strengthening over time, as we will see happens with migration. Migration is also strengthening uh, with time. And so, uh, I mean, we break it down into different components, but that's the message. The message that we find here is, well, people are farming less and they are investing less on, in their farm. In terms of businesses, okay, and these are small businesses in rural villages, okay, so we also, I mean, we don't really have here significant effects, so, I mean, nothing positive is happening at least. So, this was our puzzling result. As I said, when we started, we thought, okay, we are going to introduce mobile money, and if it happens as in Kenya, where people were eating more, we should be seeing more businesses. Uh, but we really did not see this, and this was our question. So, I mean, this is again the same slide that I explained at the beginning, but just to recap. So, the idea here is that mobile money brought the possibility of long distance insurance. And because people felt reassured that they could now migrate and still provide uh, for their family members back home in case something goes wrong, as it happens, that as it often does, then. Um, they could provide for them. And so what we see here uh, and what we find as our main result is then this idea that we had spatial occupational change, okay? So we have these, these people that were working in subsistence agriculture, I mean, at a, at a level of, I mean, where they were not always guaranteed, they were not facing episodes of hunger, as I mentioned before, and they decide to go to urban areas where they can find higher productivity occupations. So this was our testable hypothesis. And we went to the data with it. And so what we find here then is, so, um, okay, so this table is, is very full, but let me try to guide you. So this has to do with household migration, including limiters. And what we find here is that in the presence of shocks, we saw, uh, and mobile money, we saw people leaving, but we also saw people leaving here with floods, okay? And this, for anyone that has uh, looked at this kind of, uh, of literature, we know that migration, is often driven by these large shocks, okay? So floods um, make people move just because they, their homes were destroyed. So we see that, so these coefficients here in this last line show us exactly that. People migrated and higher numbers of people migrated because of the floods. But then what we see is that, <clears throat> excuse me, so in this first year, 2012, 2013, we did not really see more people migrating just because they had mobile money available. <clears throat> excuse me. But for those that suffered the flood and had the treatment, we saw some more people moving out of the village. Now, in the following year, looking at the same villages that had the flood, we see that, well, this effect is now concentrated on villages that have mobile money available. Okay, so people, presumably, those that suffered the shock may have returned. Um, and what we see overall is that migration is increasing in those villages that have mobile money. So same, I mean, the same picture looking at the different chalk shows the same, the same thing, okay? So we have more people, um, more people migrating in the villages that have mobile money and well, household level shocks also prompt people to leave, okay? So if they, if they, if they lose a job, for example, they are more likely to leave to the, to the nearby city, which is Maputo in this case. Okay, I don't know if you want questions. So we have here then other measures that are roughly consistent. Let me make a summary and then open the floor for questions. So what we saw in this, in this project was, um, well, we made this experiment where we introduced mobile money for the first time in rural areas of Southern Mozambique that have no access to formal financial services and the levels of adoption were quite high. And what we did also was to confirm that mobile money seems to uh, provide informal insurance to both uh, aggregate and idiosyncratic negative shocks. And it seems that this is due to a significant decrease in the transaction cost of sending long distance transfers. 
what we saw consistent with this was that there was increased migration out of rural areas, which prompted this decrease in agricultural activity and investment in rural areas. So overall, what, what we think is most interesting, uh, a most interesting finding and original finding of our work is this idea of spatial occupational change. So when you introduce a new technology, a new financial technology, lowering costs of, of transfers, you are um, introducing this possibility for people to move from these low productivity rural areas to higher productivity urban areas. And I think this is, in a nutshell, what I wanted to say, so I'll be more than happy to take questions now. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, and we have some time for questions, so if there are any questions, please ask. I don't believe I was that clear. <laughs> I have a question, if, please. if there aren't any others. No, no, but I see somebody else has a question, so. I know, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll ask after you. Okay, great. Um, so actually last week, uh, Wukash organized a, a seminar by, um, by um, Ms., uh, Dr. Agarwal, I can't remember her first name, Sh um, Shilpa, I think it is, Ag Agarwal. And she has a paper on uh, Malawi, in fact, where they, um, where they also had a, a randomized control trial, in fact. And they, mm -hmm. um, they actually found, um, I mean, I, they found the opposite in respect of agricultural activities. They found that that um, that the treatment group that were given mobile accounts, had been training on mobile accounts, etc., um, uh, undertook more agricultural activity um, on their on their sort of as a uh, in, in their side hustle, as it were, from what I could from what I can as I understand it. Um, and, and I know that your mechanism is different. So your mechanism is that well, agricultural activity goes down because in fact people are migrating. But I just thought it was an interesting um, kind of difference to, to kind of remark on mm -hmm. that, that, um, that their paper essentially found the opposite, at least in respect of agricultural activity. And actually, I was surprised that, that they found that. Um, so so that's, a, that's a comment comment for you, not really a question. Sorry. But, but that, I can comment on that, actually, because uh, so, well, for, to understand, I mean, to make the comparison, I would have to look at the study and understand exactly what was the design, exactly what were they offering that did that. But so I recently, I mean, we have another paper on mobile money and farming that was published this year in World Development, where we showed actually that mobile money could increase agricultural investment. But the difference is that here we were just giving people a mobile money account. We told them how it worked and we did nothing else. So in this other project, what we were doing is we were, we were paying farmers interest. So we told them that if they kept their uh, money, so we, we came at the time of harvest and we pay them for their crop and we pay them directly into mobile money. Okay, so it was there by default. And then we were paying them interest over this three month period between the harvest and the planting, we were paying them interest for that purpose. And so what we found in that case is that actually there was an effect. So we actually, we were studying also network effects that did not, were not that clear, but for that specific treatment arm or treatment intervention, paying interest, incentivizing farmers to use fertilizer did work. Okay, so we don't have, we did not collect the information then on productivity. So um, it, was, it was a relatively small project compared to this one, which was larger. But we also find that if you incentivize savings, you could have an effect. The thing here is that this was a plain product. That's why I started by saying in the beginning that this mobile money product is just very simply the ability to make transfers, to keep money in your, in your mobile money account. But as we saw, the magnitude of savings in people's mobile account was very low. Now, one difference is, so and that project that we did, it was, um, it was in Manica province, so it's actually close to Zimbabwe, a bit closer to Malawi. So that, those areas in terms of agriculture, they are much better, they are more productive than these areas, these areas in southern Mozambique. So these areas in southern Mozambique are areas in which people have traditionally migrated a lot actually to South Africa, okay? And so these are areas in which the farming is done, but it's, uh, the levels of productivity are typically very so I think that could also be part of the explanation. But to make a precise comparison, I would have to read the details of the other papers. Sorry. Thank you. Are there Thanks. any other questions? Uh, I, I have a question. Um, uh, so we mentioned that sort of migration 
increases amongst people that have access to this this mobile money, and this seem to be uh, largely associated with these negative shocks that uh, at a at a household and, and village level. Um, and so I just wanted to understand: is it is it right for us to now say that agricultural activity is sort of decreasing um, because people have have access to this sort of this mobile money? Unless these these shocks were quite frequent, but I, I think I'm I'm struggling to understand the link there. Okay, so let me detail here um, something, which is, so when we look at this table and we look here at this bottom line, uh, at these negative shocks, we do find that um, migration increases when there are negative shocks, okay? But this is in areas that have no mobile money. So negative shocks have always made people move, okay? And so this is something that we observe here, but there's nothing to do with mobile money. Now, when we look at this middle line, the treatment line, what we see here is that initially in the first year, we were not really seeing lots of people moving if they had not suffered a shock. Over time, people start leaving their villages even if they do not suffer shocks. So what, did, what I see here is that it took people some time to decide to leave their village, okay, if they did not suffer a shock. Um, what we see in the first year is that indeed, People that suffered shocks and had mobile money were the first to leave. Okay, so in a way, I, I would separate the effect on migration. So one thing is to say that there are negative shocks. When people suffer negative shocks, they migrate, they always had, and they keep leaving. Uh, and this has nothing to do with mobile money. Okay, but then we have an additional effect, which is people, if they have this negative shock and they have mobile money, they are even more likely to leave. Okay, and that's what we find. But over time, even those people that have mobile money and they have no shocks, they start leaving. So probably what this indicates, and I mean, this is suggestive, obviously it's just one episode and we need to have more evidence to be able to say something definite. But what we seem to be learning from here is that um, mobile money as a technology to provide insurance, long distance insurance, takes some time for people to uh, incorporate in, in, in their decision and to start migrating. But you do not need to, to keep having a lot of negative shocks. Does this make sense, uh, Danessa? Makes a great deal of sense. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, of course, uh, any other questions? Feel free to ask. Could I ask a question? Uh, it's regarding the lack of investment uh, in agriculture. I was wondering whether that uh, lack of investment uh, could be related to communal land um, uh, occupation as, as opposed to people uh, that have uh, property rights. Uh, because uh, in, in the case of communal lands, I uh, would predict that they were, would have lack of interest in doing investment. Yeah, that, I mean, that's obviously an important question. So we know that property is not private in Mozambique. So it's everything is all land is state owned, but people do typically not have communal land. So these are, uh, they have the right to farm small plots of land. So th these plots are really small. And I think, I mean, that, that has been shown to be one of the reasons for this low productivity is that the plots have like one act. So they are, they are small, people are doing it themselves. Sometimes, I mean, if they are doing really well, they hire a neighbor to help them doing the work. But these are by, I mean, these by, when you compare productivity, agricultural productivity numbers for Mozambique and for other neighboring countries, these are always particularly low. So these are, um, and especially in this area of the country, the southern uh, region of Mozambique, it's very, I mean, productivity is really very low. And I think that is the reason why people, when they are given the opportunity or some extra incentive, they easily move out of agriculture and try to I mean, find um, high productivity jobs in a city. And I mean, if you think about it, this is a bit, um, I mean, the history of structural transformation, right? So moving from primary sector to uh, secondary or tertiary sector, this is what we are seeing here. And so the message here in a way is that introducing this financial technology helps making this transition. It helps us accelerating this process of urbanization, which for the case of Mozambique, it has not been as strong as in other countries because the cities, I mean, they are, they are not as large as, as many others um, in, in the region. I, I also have a question. Um, 
I understand that th that wasn't your focus to study adoption of mobile money, but rather the effects. No. Uh, but uh, in terms of, for instance, pricing, the pricing was not designed for the experiment. It was the pricing of the company, right? Yes. So you, th you didn't experiment around pricing. And also it was, I found this interesting that uh, there is this uh, sort of maybe learning going on that first people use it to buy airtime, as you said, which is not mm -hmm. maybe very productive uh, activity. But then over time, they change to more productive type of uh, usage. So I wonder how, for instance, also the shocks that you mentioned, are you able to see how these shocks lead to like learning by people to use it for other reasons than just airtime? And uh, maybe your data doesn't allow for this, but since you have this panel. That's an interesting question. That, uh, I'm trying to think so, I mean, we recently wrote that, that short article just on adoption. And for sure, we observe that um, there is learning. I mean, it's the type of transaction. So, as I, so this is the pricing, which we just took as given. So we did not experiment with that. That could have been interesting, I guess. But yeah, we, we, we did not work on this. Now, in terms of, um, yeah, so airtime was reduced. So what we see here, the thing is, as I mentioned, so this is the first year. The, the the numbers for the, I mean, I could show you the table, but I think here it's even easier because the table is very full. So we saw that nearly, I mean, not 43% of people were receiving transfers, but this also coincides with a shock. So probably this was a way for, I mean, the, 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 uh, this large flood prompted people to receive and send more transfers. Okay, so um, we never got to the same level afterwards. Over time, even though we, we had new users coming into the service, we never saw um, these uh, level of transfers being replicated, okay? Perhaps because they were not necessary because we were not observing over this time period these large um, aggregate shocks. But what we see, so what we found over time in these new users were mostly doing remote payments. We even had people taking loans. Um, say we had people paying their, their um, mortgage. I mean, this is not the more, it's just a lot. I mean, mortgage is my wording, it's a wrong wording. It's loans, they were, they, were, they were now paying loans remotely. And so this is something that was picking up here. So we did another study with mobile money in um, with micro enterprises in urban areas. And there we saw uh, that remote payments picked up a lot. Okay, so more recently, one of the big um, uses for, for mobile money is electricity electronic payments. So in this sample, because it's very specific, it's about rural areas, transfers are extremely important, particularly in times of shocks. But what we learned by work with micro enterprises um, in urban areas is that uh, electronic payments, remote payments are a big use for mobile money um, for those people. So it varies a lot. So uh, again, this is a specific, I mean, we try to be as rigorous as we could describing both what happens and what were the consequences. Uh, but when we look at other other settings, we saw we saw different patterns. Okay, exactly as I described both for the agriculture, for the farmers, and also for these micro entrepreneurs in urban areas. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I wonder, we are over time, but if there's another question, maybe the last one, then we can take it probably. I guess the, there are no questions. So I would like to thank you again for your very interesting presentation. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I hope I'll be able to visit you very soon. <laughs> yes, we're looking forward to be able to hold our regular workshops organized by ERSA. And I hope there will be a chance to meet them in person. Uh, yeah, and same here. Yeah, I hope to, to be able to welcome you in, in Lisbon as well. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much again. Bye. Bye-bye.